campaigning for civil rights in Kenya. But soon she developed a dramatic new way to use the web to document reality and harness the power of the crowd. She was driven by the horrific violence in 2008 following elections in Kenya. At the time, I had gone home to vote um, for the election. It was my first time voting, actually. And so for me, it was a very emotional moment. And I was also covering on my blog the period leading to the campaign. Uh, it was a very contested election. I think none of us anticipated the fallout. The results of the election were disputed amidst allegations of ballot rigging. Tribal violence broke out between supporters of rival candidates. The official media struggled to cover the spreading crisis. So they, diaspora people, were getting information from their families, sending it to me and people locally. And I realized what I was seeing from the citizens was not being captured when I turned on my TV, what I was seeing. I mean, I thought clearly, if, if this is just me, one individual, who's getting all this kind of, there must be a lot of stuff going on that we are not seeing in the news. Ori pulled together a team and created a website called Ushahidi. Ushahidi means witness in Swahili, and it allowed ordinary people to report attacks and create a minute-by-minute -minute snapshot of the turmoil. By giving them a voice, it put pressure on the Kenyan authorities to take action to stem the violence. The attention was phenomenal, something we didn't anticipate. And what we quickly grew to realize was that there was a need for this kind of platform. And so we realized that we need to turn this into a tool that anybody can use. Ushahidi reminds me of the early days of the web. It seems to me that with sites like these, we're actually realizing the potential of the technology and that the world is grappling with what that all means. The web's ability to harness the power of millions of individual voices is unprecedented in human history. This appears to be the dream of the great leveling made real, a paradigm shift on a par with the invention of the printing press. We talk about the web and the internet as if they're the same thing, but they're not. The web is simply the links, information, and web pages delivered to us over the infrastructure known as the internet. The roots of the internet can be traced back to early 1960s America, when military and university mainframe computers were hooked together via the telephone system. Email was born in 1965, and common standards began to allow files to be transferred between networks. But getting to information was still extremely difficult. Users had to know exactly where it was stored and how to tell their computer to find it in effect by phoning up another computer. The web as we experience it today, where anyone can access almost anything, just didn't exist. In this world before websites, if you went online, you were walled into small corners of cyberspace. To create the web as we now know it would take someone to write a common language that would link the data stored on computers around the planet. A man who would invent the World Wide Web. I invented the web just because I needed it, really, because it was so frustrating that it didn't exist. Only by creating a global information network that anyone could access would the web become a leveling technology. The story of its development begins deep underground more than half a century ago. This is CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research Geneva, only yards from the French frontier. In 1954, 12 European countries began collaborating on a project to smash the atom and unravel the mystery of the tiny particles that form its nucleus. Tim Berners-Lee began working there in 1980. Or is it so an exciting environment, people coming from different countries, people coming from different universities, working for different people, 
And because they didn't all work for the same company, they weren't all told to buy the same software and buy the same computer. So they came with different sorts of computer, different sorts of software, so their documentation was all in different systems. And you wouldn't be able to really bring up the information from one thing at the, at the same time as the other. You'd have to bring up information from one and write it on the back of an envelope and then go to the other system and maybe type it back in. Berners-Lee began to develop a radical new system to try and link all of the different computer systems that were being used by CERN's multinational workforce. He submitted a paper in 1989 with the deceptively mundane title, Information Management, a proposal. I wrote a memo uh, about the idea and I put it around. It turned out that my boss had written vague but exciting in the top corner of his copy and uh, that was perhaps why he let me do the project in my spare time. Berners-Lee took some already existing software tools and created something revolutionary. His vague but exciting idea would become the World Wide Web. And at CERN, on the 6th of August, 1991, the first website went online. I know that you'd love me to say that, well, I got it all wired up and then there was a big switch and three, three, threw the switch and the lights dimmed for a moment, but then there was this incredible high-pitched whine and that was the web taking off all across the world, people starting to log on and type in hypertext and we could feel if the, the, the power, all these links spreading across the planet and we just had to hold on tight. And then the call came in from the BBC and the New York Times and The Economist about what it was that was happening to the world and the stock market sort of took this incredible uptake. Uh, and then we turned it off. Uh, <laughs> no, it was... Uh, so <laughs> it was started off in a very small way. Berners-Lee's system has become the universal means of connecting all computer content. His critical breakthrough was to marry an existing idea called hypertext, a way of linking between documents, to the infrastructure and protocols of the Internet. To do this, he assigned documents a unique address, or URL. These were the first web pages, created and formatted in a new universal language called HTML that could link to other web pages on any networked computer anywhere. By solving a specific technical problem, the web opened up an entire universe of information to anyone with a computer. It seemed like a brave new world. It seemed like a new democracy. It seemed like a new way of people coming together. It seemed the most fantastic, radical and extraordinary development since Gutenberg in 1450 uh, produced his Bible and his first pieces of print. The dream that everybody wanted to be connected, you know, that goes way, way back. It's about letting people share information. Built into the web's design is an ability to connect individuals without great wealth or power. Today, all around the world, being connected is empowering people, like Kujo Agbavi, a Ghanaian farmer. First, I was an illiterate in the use of the internet, but the friend introduced it to me, and then uh, he taught me at least how to browse and then, then find out all these things. Kujo uses the web to learn how to grow crops more efficiently and to compete with much bigger farms. I use the internet to find the prices of the commodities and then the market where can easily and quickly be bought. But the management and the marketing of the produce has greatly been changed. I feel more connected to the world. But the web is more than just an empowering tool. It's deliberately structured in a way that resists authority. The web was designed to give all users equal access. You don't need permission to visit a website or to create one. And when you're on the web, there are no governments generating rules and regulations. 
There's no center and no controlling authority. It's the ultimate leveling.